We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. We'll be delighted to be joined from across the Irish Sea by a friend of the pod, Dave Fanning. Dave, Dave Fanning, lovely, lovely to see, to see you. you. Lovely to see you both as well. <laughs> in your in what looks like a very imp- in front of a very impressive looking wall of gold discs, uh, which you've uh, you've earned yourself. I We're suppose. Just say, don't use the word deserve or earned. I happen to work <laughs> in the unit. I'll give him one for God's sake, you know. So it doesn't really mean very much, as you can well imagine. <laughs> now, Dave, loving Dave, the Beatles pictures. Those are fantastic. Yeah, I got those from me and I for whatever, as I say, my services to the Beatles. Services to the Beatles, without, without you. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. <laughs> I know. It's so right, it would not have happened. <laughs> so where are you now? You're in Dublin, presumably. I'm in Dublin in my house, in my not so much attic as Dan. There is an attic actually in this house, but we have Christmas decorations up there and nothing else. So once a year we go up there. It's very scary. <laughs> Whereas this is my kind of... Is it a den? Is that what I call it? An indoor yeah. den? I suppose it is, yeah. A den, very, yeah. Very good. Yeah, the question we very often ask people when we have them on this is, is can you remember what record playing machinery was in your house when you were a child? So we get an idea of the, your environment. I can remember. First of all, I'm the youngest of six kids. Oh, well. And therefore, they were all really into music in a huge way. So there was massive a advantage. Yeah, a, a huge. There was a queue for the record player. So you'd lift up this lid. Oh, gosh, I wish I knew what type of... And you'd press the button over like that and the little thing came over, the record went down, the needle went over on it, and if you had it at the wrong speed, it kind of went the wrong place because I forgot to change it to 33. From, and by the way, it had a 78 as well. And you could play two albums on top of each other, but by the time you did the third one, it got kind of wonky. So you really were better off taking one off at each time. That's what I had first. I think it was a bush. And, and what records can you remember playing? I mean, your, your elder brothers and sisters and your parents' records. What, what things do you remember when you were growing up in the well, house? I remember yeah. most would be, I mean, I would remember back to the late 50s, believe it or not, in terms of one or two things, like the day Buddy Holly died, for instance. I remember being at school for that. And somebody got up in front of the class and sang That'll Be The Day. And I never knew this guy at the age of five years of age was so talented. It was unbelievable. And the fact that he was allowed to do that was even unbelievable in good old Catholic Ireland. Anyway, <laughs> point is that um, I, the first record I ever got, I asked for on my fifth or sixth birthday was um calendar girl by neil sadaka i would have great record many, yeah i would have bought many beatley albums 63 64 65 but didn't need to because my brothers did so the first one i actually paid for in fact i went up to the local shop in stalorgan it's a place in south dublin and um it's called golden discs and i went in with 10 bob note and i said i want to put this down as a deposit for the beatles album oh, it's out in five months time and the guy knew that this was a pain in the neck guy who came in <laughs> said, oh yeah what, 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 what i can give you some titles one song was called yellow submarine another song was called within you without you and it was like what, being for the benefit of mr kite i mean these things were so important and that was in the enemy it is it's extraordinary to uh, re- mark and i often talk about this the excitement of reading lists of titles of upcoming albums by the rolling stones or bob dylan or, or the beatles was just Absolutely magical, wasn't it? What, what is Mother's Little Helper? What could that possibly be about? All this, they sounded so charismatic, these titles. I know, and we had no idea what Mother's Little Helper was. No, absolutely. We do now. So um, you, get, you, you, you put a 10 bob deposit. <laughs> Yeah, on a, on a copy of Sergeant Pepper. It was 30 bob. It cost 30 bob, so I had to get a pound. Isn't that right? Yeah, I had to get a pound within the next five months to it actually pay. 32 and 6 in the UK. I don't know, probably, <laughs> probably comparable in the in yeah. island, does. It was very, very important, all those things. I mean, the funny thing about it is, is that when I speak of the NME, my brother had the NME uh, on order, whatever you call it, at the local news agents about 100 yards up the road place called Foster Avenue in Mount Merion in Dublin. And um, that was in 1959. So like the big battles on the front pages were Elvis, Cliff. Elvis, who's the Elvis versus Cliff, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Like, you know, he, he gave it up by 72 and I took it up then. And I didn't stop it till 2001. So think about it for a second. In the one shop in Dublin, the enemy <laughs> every week was on order in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the noughties. Beat that, the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> You put their kids through college. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Incredible. You probably did. 
So, so when they, go no, on. Because my brother like threw all the enemies out. And but it, like just to make room as one needs to do, and then, but he cut out the charts. The charts were on page three in every issue, and it's fascinating the charts because, but give like the top thirty or the top fifty, whatever it was, and then on the right hand side later on it was like top twenty albums in America, top twenty singles in America. But at the beginning it wasn't like that. Now two things I want to say about that. The first is that on the back of the charts was the news pages. So I he cut out all the charts. So I've got things like uh, Cliff not leaving shadows, you know, <laughs> or, or John Entwistle. No, not John Entwistle. It was Pete Townsend saying Lily not pornographic. Says Townsend. <laughs> this guy is brilliant stuff. But look, he said, are you ready? I'm going to show something here. Am I allowed? Oh, to go on. What you got? Can you right. see that? No. I can see a reflection of myself. See a reflection of David Hepworth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, You're gonna have to tell us what that is. Yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what it is. Okay. That's me and Paul McCartney there. But you know what that is there? That there is the enemy charts from 1962 or three or whatever it is, signed by Paul McCartney. When I showed it to him, he said, "Gosh, can I have this?" I said, "No, you can't." With the first, <laughs> Beatles, with the first Beatles song in it, number 17. He thought I was giving it to him. Sign the damn thing. So he signed, and there's the first Beatles, whatever. It is, "Love Me Do" or "Please Love Me Do." Me. So that's 1962, is it? Yeah. That, and then yeah. here's, here's this bit here, he signed that too, which is the inner sleeve of the White Album from a CD. Beat that. <laughs> That, that is fantastic. He I love won. the way he thought it was for him. He snatched yeah, it away. But that would be that would be the kind of thing that would mean a great deal to somebody like Paul no, McCartney no. because he, he remembers that as being, you know, when he wasn't famous kind of thing. It must be really odd. Not only that, but like on the right hand side, there's no US charts or anything like that. Do you, do you know what the little charts are? Best selling sheet music in the Yeah, man, there you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. It's still yeah. available. Yeah. Chad Harris so, and Tony Nian at number one. So you must have you must have interviewed McCartney a number of times. No, I've only interviewed him twice. Uh, once in his office in London and once in Spain, and both this century actually. I never saw him or anything before that. I've interviewed Ringo, but I've never met John and George. Um, right. The, the Beatles, like I was in their fan club. It was just the right age, around six or seven. I joined the thing called the fan club. Got the flexi disc every Christmas. Oh, did you get the Christmas C uh, flexi? Oh, I can watch well, every single line. The boys I around. can too. Were yeah. they amazing? Yeah. Oh, they're fantastic. And uh, I, I, you also got a very good poster because I was in one or two other fans, uh, fan thing, me bobs, and they weren't very good. But the Beatles one were actually very good. I think it was an Irish woman called Kelly who used to. Frida you, Kelly. Frida right. Kelly. Yeah. Frida She's Kelly used to run it. Well, now, didn't Frida, no, hang on a second, I got this wrong. Alan Smith, who was the editor of the NMA, married Mavis, didn't he? Who, who also was involved in the Beatles. Really? Now, Fre Frida Kelly ran the Beatles fan club, and I think I'm right in saying this. Frida Kelly, not long ago, like everybody in the world, made it, starred in a documentary, uh, which is probably on Netflix or something, You're about right. my part in the Beatles story. And she's quite heavy in that documentary. Yeah, she's in it, quite, she's in it all the time. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you get involved in broadcasting? Um, there you were was in pirate a, radio, weren't you? Were you in I was in radio? pirate radio yeah. 77, 78, and there was nobody really listening at the very beginning. But some, one night we were raided, and suddenly pirates became the thing. So RTE, which is the BBC of Ireland, said, If we were thinking of a pop music station, we'd better start now. So the equivalent of BBC Radio One started in 79, yours started in 67, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, I was in pirate radio first, but I was in college, came out of college became a teacher for a year and there was oh, really? a magazine yeah there was, there was a magazine um called scene magazine and the guys it's too hard to explain but they all went off to form a thing called hot press which i'm sure you've heard oh of. yeah yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Left scene behind so i took scene over and edited scene or whatever for 12 months but that got me into radio in a, in a circuitous route and that's all i ever wanted to do anyway so so you never do you never did the kind of clubbing dj wedding dj all that kind of thing it was just straight no. on the radio you were no. you were a dj was it mcgonagall's so That's right. I was yeah. deep in McGonagall 77, 78, 79, yeah. three nights a week. And then I did Pirate Radio four nights a week. So seven nights in the centre of Dublin City for a few years. Yeah, I was. But like that wasn't kind of wedding DJ or playing the right stuff DJ. That was, hey, I'm cool. I'm only playing Echo and the Bunny Man. I'm not playing YMCA. <laughs> that kind of a thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose that was were you, a DJ. But... Were you really like that, Dave? I find it hard to believe yeah, you're too. ever <laughs> like that. I can't <laughs> see. If people say, who's Dave Fanning? I go, well, he's the, he's the Irish John Peel, only he's not like John Peel at all, really. No, I, I tell you, I do. Like, I remember the, the seismic shift. I mean, in the 1970s, like when John Peel changed overnight from playing whatever he played of progressive rock 
just like that. They're all gone, and now it's punk. I was saying, wow, that was pretty major. I could never do that. I could never. First of all, I think prog rock gets the bad press. I love prog rock. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I also, like, I would never not think that the Beatles are the greatest thing that ever walked this earth and a million things like that, you know. And even when John Peel is in your book, the current book, there he is over in, in um, Dallas, Texas, and he's yeah. there, Kennedy. And then he's there when Kennedy gets assassinated. And I think John Peel, had, he didn't like the Beatles, did he? <laughs> No, well, he did very well out of uh, pretending to know the Beatles and by assuming a, a strong Liverpudlian accent and, uh, and when he was out like, there, wasn't he? And he claimed to be friends of theirs, which kind of... Kind of, was kind of a, yeah, he did a career on the on radio based on that. Yeah. I, think it, I think it's fair to say that anybody who was really successful, he had a complicated relationship with. Well, yeah, he goes on top of the pops with Rod. He was a good friend of Mark Boland's. What did he do? He pulled into a sideline and cried when Mark song got to number one they were big names and he he did like them didn't he well he, he certainly liked them before they were big names i don't know i don't know how he but he was he fell out with them when they were successful <laughs> he oh, really yeah. did he resented to some extent he resented their success i think right. and, and hated the, the fact that they were... thing, maggie may was so bad <laughs> yeah. right so you, you you haven't kept an awful lot of records you were telling me mm. well i have and i haven't i mean i moved and i didn't really keep my eye on the ball and I lost certain records. Like there's two different types of records. The ones that I sweated in college to make money and buy. And then once I joined 2FM in Dublin, I got them all sent to me from record companies. And that's the two different ones. I have a lot of those ones still. I have about maybe a thousand, maybe 1500. But what I don't have is the best collection around that I, I was the guy who had it, that I had bought every single one. And it does, you know, do I miss them? Yeah, I do. The ones I miss the most, oddly enough, are the obscure ones. Go on. I'd have about three that like, I just think, oh, I can't believe I lost them because I never got them again. Like a double album, An Evening with Wild Man Fisher. I mean, like, you know, you can't beat that. <laughs> That's number one. I also had the album by the legendary Stardust Cowboy, and I don't have that. I've only got the single Paralyzed. But I also had um, an amazing album called The World of Harry Parch. Tell oh, yes. Yeah. Now, tell us about Harry Parch. Harry Parch, people like Tom Waits often... Uh, name check 100%. Harry Park. Well, I'll tell you, explain thing. to me about him because okay. I don't really know. Go on. The funny thing is, and here comes my first name drop besides Paul McCartney. I'm sorry about this. But one of the times I interviewed David Bowie, um, David Bowie uh, mentioned something about Harry Parch once. I said, Oh, yeah, I know him. I was, I mean, he just went, What? You've heard of Harry Parch? Harry, like, you see, again, David, you and Mark would know this from all the magazines that you've done and whatever. The importance of reading in a music magazine in the 1970s, like, there was nothing else. You got the music magazine or you got there was a thing on BBC Radio 1 at 7 o'clock every evening called Sounds of the 70s and it was yeah. five nights a week and it was a different person every and it was the most it was a religious thing you know you got the transistor and you stuck it out the window to try and get the reception and all the you had to hear it I mean the pop stuff of the day was fine because pop music in the 70s was okay compared to the 80s anyway the point is that like you know you had to listen to these programs so Harry Parch um, it was Rolling Stone magazine used to do these fantastic 10 or 20 page things like you know, I don't really have any interest in the music of Elton John, but 20 pages on the road for a week with Elton John, fascinating. Yeah, I just yeah, love yeah. He's such an yeah. interesting character. And all these kind of things. But one of them was about a guy called Harry Parch. He was a really old guy, lived in California somewhere, and his whole house was a sound system. Like, he had all these rumblings under the floorboards and that, but every instrument he ever had, he made out of found things. So he had a gourd tree and weird stuff. And there was a... And there was, I've got to hear this. Now, there was no other way of hearing this you couldn't as you know in the 70s you couldn't hear these kind of things anywhere so i remember i went to new york once and i went into a shop now you won't believe this but it is true and i said to the guy you know these guys behind the counter they're all so cool and they're cooler than you are and everything and he said i said listen you wouldn't have an album by a guy called harry parch would you man go no no we don't no and what kind of music does he do and i said well kind of weird music we'll try our weird section over there <laughs> seriously so i go over this section and it's w e i r d section kind of thing and there's about a thousand albums in it. the second album was the world of harry park there you go so I said, right gotta buy this so i buy the album and um, i bring it back home to dublin i put it it was very expensive actually for some reason it would it be expensive than the current kind of things so i brought it on put it on, put it on and on that record player that i mentioned earlier i had a 45 on it it was a single thing and i put on the wrong speed so the whole of side two played, and I thought, geez, that's that's pretty good, all right. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was the wrong. So when I turned so it's it dance over, dance music, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Like, yeah, with good trees. <laughs> so when I turned it over, 
Um, and he starts singing about a song called uh, a town called Barstow in California. Like, wow, that sounds like the Chipmunks. It was at the wrong speed. So that's how <laughs> much I knew. But I remember the cover and all his instruments and that. And I really regret somewhere along the way, moving house, moving whatever, and it just moved out of my life. And I don't have a lot of those things anymore. Because oh, every one of those albums were gobbled, blood, sweat, and tears. I can tell you, there was even a few blood, sweat, and tears albums. <laughs> yeah, they, you must be able to. You must be able to get hold of copies via Discogs or one of these. Uh, must be some website could reunite you with with an evening with Wild Man Fisher. Oh, yeah. But he's he's probably better recalled than it is actually experienced. I think that might. It um, couldn't, I, couldn't be resuscitated. No, absolutely right. No, yeah. so better as it was. In yeah. your in your position uh, in in Ireland, you you must get loads of demo tapes and so forth from from people who are kind of up yeah. and coming. Is that is that the case? Do you hang on to those kind of things? To be honest, um, there are boxes and boxes and boxes of those where the producer of the program, Ian Wilson, has put away an RT and they're there somewhere and someday they will be mined. And I, I, there's lots of albums of Peel sessions. There really probably should be albums of Fanning sessions, but I'm too lazy to do anything about it. And lots of bands that lasted three and four months and I have great memories of them all. And they're somewhere stuck in here more than, you know, on a record player or anything. But yeah, I mean, like I kept one or two. Only the other day I found one by the Cranberry Saw Us. And that's like they became the cranberries very quickly. There's one, which is a terrible name, isn't it? Really? Oh my god, <laughs> the cranberry saw us. Yeah, I mean, one <laughs> of the worst names ever. You know? Agonizing puns, so worse how, than the Beatles. How are we spelling that? So it's saw us. What, like, as in, oh, no, it's, it's the cranberry like, saw S A W U S, is it? The cranberry yeah, saw is. us. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think Mark as a David, pun on sauce. Yeah, but I think David is thinking it's something to do with a dinosaur. Yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Brontosaurus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the cranberry. And uh, so I found that, and I also found this, by the way. But uh, I did give you this one. Do you see that? Oh yeah. Of... So what How is that? As you two. It's U two's demo. My first demo tape from U two. What What are uh, the songs on it? Well, there are six songs on it. Um, gosh, hold on a minute now. I'll see how. Just see exactly the print isn't that big. I might need the glasses for this. Right, right. Um, well, there's like things like um, uh, "Out of Control" is there, which was there at the beginning, and it came, like this would uh, an album would have come out about two years later, I'd say. And there's "False Prophet" and "No Man's Land." There's "Alone in the Light." I don't know what that is. Another time, another place. There. I mean, there are a few songs on it that um, never appeared anywhere after that. Has it and, got? Uh, what I want to know is, does it have a, a kind of phone poll on the, this yeah, number now, after yeah. six yeah. o'clock? Really funny you say that because I know it was the lead singer who put all this together. So it says who the lineup is, and it's uh, Bono, Adam Clayton, The Edge, Larry Mullen. Uh, it says Larry Mullins. Never heard right. that before. It's always Larry Mullen or Larry Mullen Jr. And um, he's uh, 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 Bono spells Paul McGuinness's name incorrectly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> G-I-N-N-E-S-S or something. There's a bunch of other little pieces of where it was made, Eamon Andrews Studios. Eamon Andrews Studios. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the connections. That's <laughs> Eamon, and, Eamon Andrews was a big star yeah, for a long, yeah. long time. This is your wife. <laughs> Whatever. Um, there's all this of these is things. your wife. <laughs> 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 anyway, <there's> all, <laughs> but also, Bono has, has drawn an... Um, um, what do you call it? A, a tree in crayon on the cover. But and here's my point, right? Stay with me for a second here, because that's very nice to have a lovely artifact in that. But you know that, or the money. Uh, give me the money any other week. So my point is this: Do you remember when um, a day in the life, and they found a piece of paper that it was written on, or some nonsense like this, and it sold for one point two million. So then there was the thing that, uh, like a Rolling Stone, Bob Dylan in a Washington hotel and on a napkin. He had written something. Now, he hadn't written all the lyrics out. He had crossed them out. So, therefore, it was a work in progress. Therefore, yeah. it's worth more money. So, it sells for two million. Kurt Cobain sells his jacket for an MT USA or the MT, whatever it was called, um, live MTV thing. And I mean, like, unplugged. That sold for 300 grand. His, his guitar for 600. Last, a couple of weeks ago, Bill Wyman's guitar. But so, the so band would forgive you if you sold that, surely. <laughs> <Here's> <laughs> like, <laughs> Here's my point. I'm open to offers. But by the way, can I just say that, uh, you know, those guys at the Crucible when they're playing snooker and they kind of dress perfectly and they have white gloves on, they put the ball back on. Well, I have two guys outside ready to bring this back to the vaults of the Bank of Ireland in O'Connell Street. So it's not in my house. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's funny about the lyrics. 
not long ago, a couple of years ago, Don McLean. Oh, listen, Don said, I know I'm dropping. Don McLean. Yeah. Now, hold on a second. David, before you say anything, before you say anything, the, a week after, um, what do you call it, um, uh, the Bob Dylan ones, uh, the, yeah, the, like a Rolling Stone, Don McLean, oh, look, I found my original lyrics of, of American Pie. Fancy that. Yeah. 15 pages. And by the way, he said, and some of it was written on paper that I found in a dustbin, which is another 100,000, I'm sure. So, like, the point I'm making is, did he really? I mean, did he yeah. put some toffee stains on it like this and some yellow paper and a bad pencil? And then, six weeks later, he found the bloody music for Vincent. <laughs> what are the chances? <laughs> I mean, what are the chances? Exactly, Mark. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you've got the same suspicions as I had when the American Pie suddenly appeared. I thought, this yeah. is just too perfect for words. Why has he never mentioned this before? You know, yeah, exactly, yeah. It yeah. Be the, and also, when a song's being worked on, there must be loads of versions of it. You know what I mean? There's one that you hand to the bass player or, or whatever, you know, exactly. one that somebody had when they were mixing it. Yeah, how do you, how do you exactly. prove what's the, it's like fragments of the true cross, isn't it? You know, this is, <laughs> this is. It's, a, it's a stretch too far with all of this. But anyway, I'm not doubting Don for one second, I'd say. He's very no, funny. no, clearly that wouldn't clearly be the case in, in, in Don's case. But so your, your U2 thing will go back to the vault. I love the idea that it's got, has he got his phone number on it? Yeah, I don't ask you to tell me his phone number, no, phone but I'm number, sure he's not living there anymore. Anyway. There's a phone number for Paul McGuinness on it, and it doesn't oh, right. have the, the prefixes that you now have on a Dublin phone number. That's how long ago it was, you know. Right. Richard you Williams, Richard Williams, Richard Williams has oh, still God. got the tape, hasn't he? Who? The uh, Richard Williams yeah. uh, has still got the tape in the tape box uh, of early Roxy Music. Oh, Roxy Music. And, and it just says, hey, it was a tape, it's a reel to reel. I think it's kind of pre set or something like this. And, uh, and it actually says, you know, from Brian after eight o'clock. That's right. Like. Which, one? Know, so it, Which one? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Eno. No, I, Brian. Think, I think it's Ferry was the, I don't think Brian Eno had joined at that point. Which launched their career, because he wrote a piece of the Melbourne about that. And it got them eventually a record deal. Didn't and it? He's, I he's, he's kept he was it. involved with Ireland. Yeah. That is amazing yeah. you could say that, because if there was one album I wanted to find in any way, and I don't have it, which is terrible, and I used to, like my favourite debut album of all time is the first Roxy Music album. Now, tell me this, Dave. This is interesting you should raise this. Did your version of it have Virginia... No, it did not have Penny Lane. The, oh, no, the Penny Virginia, Lane. <laughs> Penny, it Virginia certainly Penny. didn't have Penny Lane. <laughs> Sorry, it didn't have Virginia <laughs> It didn't have Virginia Okay, because they put Virginia Plain on it later, didn't they? They yeah. made the first album. And so my, my contention is the first album is still quite a difficult record. Once it hasn't got Virginia Plain on it, and they went with it. Uh, uh, Tony Tony Wadsworth, who rang EMI, rang EMI for years in in Britain, used to tell me, he says, bands will only make their hit single once they finish their album. Once they feel they've done their artistic statement, you then listen to it and you go, Do you know, it's great. It's it needs brilliant. a single. But I'll tell you what, it needs a single. And as long as they're convinced that it's great and that you think it's great, they'll then go away and write a single. And Roxy Music did exactly that with Virginia Plain. I'm not sure if that's the same story that you have in your current book. Is that, did the Stones go off and write Satisfaction when they had stuff done? Well, it wasn't, for, it wasn't particularly for an album. They, they, they just needed a single. You know, they, they used to make singles on their own. But there are many cases of this uh, happening. Yeah. I think you said that uh, Blur did it with, uh, I can't remember which, uh, and Coldplay did it. Well, you know the famous story, Michael Jackson finishes Thriller and they go through it and then they go, oh, it's not quite there. So he goes away and writes Billy Jean and beat it. <laughs> well, you so, see, yeah, I, you are right about that because they have the confidence to like, okay, the album is finished kind of thing, you know? Yeah, no absolutely. Need. It's a, it's a like, really different thing. The album doesn't need Virginia playing when it has Remake, Remodel and Lady Tron and Chance Meeting and 2HB and in particular, if there is something. I mean, like Brian Ferry was just... I'm nothing against the croon bar, wine bar music they became by album five and six. Good luck to them. And by the way, really weird, Avalon is album nine, and that was their biggest selling album, and then they broke up. 
which I find really weird. But the first, and obviously you took the title of your last book from the opening track on the second album, uh, Fabulous Creation, but, yeah. uh, which was also a brilliant album. But the first album, I mean, there is something, I mean, even like, you know the way you read so much into everything, it was so important. And I only found out 20 years later that that great kind of chorusy thing, <laughs> was they looked out the window and saw the, the number on a car. Do you know that thing? No, okay, you don't. Okay, wait a minute. Um, what do you call the, sorry, I'm lost it now. What do you call the, the number of a car? Number plate? Uh, number number plate. plate. Thank, right you. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. And like, they have a, a whole <laughs> chorus and it's just that number plate. Sure, I read, the, you know, the I Ching into the damn thing. <laughs> I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Now, do you know where, that re where they recorded that album? I, I, they recorded that album overlooking Piccadilly Circus. Do they? Yeah. They, it was, uh, or overlooking Piccadilly. I think it was in the building, next to the building, where S Simpsons of Piccadilly used to be, which is now Waterstones, Command right. Studios. It used to be up there overlooking the road. So they obviously, they got that, uh, that well, car number. Production-wise, it does sound a bit demo tapey, but that's one of the things I love about it. It's and just, was there ever a record that was, that was more influenced by its sleeve? I mean, the, the, that sleeve was so phenomenal, or rather its sales were influenced oh, by it. Mean, I could sit here like, for four hours and argue that one. Um, I mean, every sleeve was important. Every sleeve. I don't want to use the yeah. word I but I mean, I know they've all turned into a very heavy coffee table book now, album sleeves and... But I mean, it's just, you know, unless it has the worn bit around like that. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I mean, like, give me an album sleeve and let me talk for hours. You know? yeah. So you, you've let all this go. But so what do you do? You sit there during the long winter evenings and think, ah, the ones that got away. The ones that got away. <laughs> they all got away. Yeah, I mean, like I've loads here on this side here. Like uh, I now have a lot of those kind of boxy ones that they give out now with like right right and badges and stuff you know right right okay. it's not the same thing of course no no sure so if we had if we had asked you to name the greatest record ever made which we normally do in these chats and people just produce magically you know from their feet they nice. say it's this you can't do that can you what no. would it be then would it be an evening with one man Fisher? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fisher, sure if I had it, yeah. Um, I, I mean, do I have to? Would I have to go for a Beatles? And if so, I don't even know. You choose for anything. No compulsory. No, at all. absolutely anything. No, it's your you idea of the greatest record. Okay, the greatest. The one that's song. meant the most to you. Okay, the greatest record, the greatest song ever. I'm sorry, but it is pretty famous. It is the Beatles. It's Strawberry Fields Forever. Because when that happened to Penny Lane on one side and the other side, it was like, what is this? I, you know, and then it just became the greatest thing of all time. And albums, album wise, I mean, what do you want? Blonde on Blonde? I don't know. I, I'm supposed to produce something here from my <laughs> vaults and I don't have it necessarily. I mean, I don't have the ones I want. I mean, maybe the Ramones second album, Ramones Leave Home or Something like that. I, I, you know, any one of those would do it for me. Right, right, right. And so, do you, do you still play records? Yeah, I, I mean, I have vinyl thing. I have the vinyl player here in this very room, and I do play vinyl. Yeah, and I now and again, every so often. Yeah. Right, right. So, how are you getting on with uh, lockdown and coronavirus and uh, the great unpleasantness of the last? How long has it been now? Well, I'm really nine months. And what I'm trying to do is get something together that most people got together 15 years ago, which is too late. It's kind of a website with a lot of stuff. Like I have loads of photographs with rock stars all fall all around the floor here and nobody ever sees. Should I put them up there and let people see them? Sure, why not? So I'm, I'm trying to get something like that all together and maybe I will one of these days or maybe right. I won't. So right. in lockdown, I'm enjoying listening to music and that's really it in a nutshell and going down to work at the weekends. Is there some old record that you've rediscovered over the last few months that, uh, that you meant a lot to you, that you just... You know, had the time to go back and find again. Yeah, I would say um, Rock and Roll with the Modern Lovers. That <laughs> album. Oh, They're right. That's a great record. Absolutely. Wonderful. Important. And there's so many great songs on it. I think maybe my favourite would be Summer Morning. It's just the way it comes in. I love it. I mean, the whole album is great. And it also sounds like it was recorded in a toilet. Were you the plugger on that day? I was the plugger on, uh, on well, rock, and ro rock and Roll with the Modern Lovers. Yeah, I was... Uh, yeah, I was the plugger at Berserkly Records in the Berserkly, UK. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we had three hits, all Jonathan Richmond. Ice Cream uh, Ro Man. Roadrunner. Uh, oh, Egyptian that. Reggae. Yeah, that was on that. Yeah. And then uh, Morning of Our Lives, which oh, is yeah. Morning yeah. of Our Lives, which is from the live album, I think. Right. Yeah. So Egyptian Reggae is from Rock and Roll with the Modern Lovers. And Egyptian Reggae is the classic case of the truth of the old record company uh, saw that where there's a hit, there's a writ. 
because as soon as that got top 10 in the UK, really? uh, a, a reggae producer from Jamaica came out of the woodwork and, uh, and argued that it was, it was uh, pinched from uh, a reggae instrumental called, and here's, you couldn't make this up, called None Shall Escape the Judgment. <laughs> <laughs> By Johnny Clark or something like that. Yeah, and so he, he, well, I think like all those things, it's, uh, you know, you deal with it by giving them a few percent, don't you? Yeah, of, uh, yeah. uh, 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 you, don't, you don't give them all of it. Um, yeah. And so I'm very gratified you that that's a favorite of yours. Oh, Dave. I absolutely a, love that. You know, do you know, I haven't played it in years. I was, I was with Jonathan Richmond and the Model Lovers when they came over and toured. So there's Didn't he walk all the way from Heathrow Airport? He, 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 ran, he, ran, he, ran. From, he ran from Heathrow yeah. Airport to Kingston. Yeah. That's, that's how, and Jonathan was fitness fanatic at a time when nobody was. No. You know, was no. yeah. He was really careful about everything he ate and didn't drink and so forth and looked after himself. But he goes on stage at Hammersmith and then, well, first of all, the free, uh, free Trade Hall in Manchester. And he's, he comes on stage in front of a crowd who were just, they just want Roadrunner. They just want, you know, hospital. They just want she yeah. cracked. Yeah. And he walks on stage, you know, with an acoustic band and plays Ice Cream Man seven times. And they were, and I learned a very important lesson <laughs> that night, is that punk rock fans were every bit as conservative as, as every other former fan yeah they didn't want anything but that the thing they, that they, they just want the hits yeah, they, yeah. They, well they wanted they wanted something reassuringly loud and brash you know yeah. and jonathan wasn't wasn't that because he said and we used to laugh he said i don't want to do anything that would hurt little children's ears well now of course i think yes i think of oh, fair point actually <laughs> now, now that we're all rock deaf yeah. <laughs> you know he had a fair point i think I think noise pollution will be the next frontier of rock and roll if it ever comes back. You know, yeah, right. I think Possibly, people right. start being careful about that kind of thing. What a Dave. sensitive soul! Amazing. I can remember going to see him with my son backstage in a, a gig in Shepherd's Bush, and he was saving his voice. We had a ten-minute conversation entirely written down. We wrote questions, and then he would write his answers. I mean, that's eccentric, isn't it? What I associate it, him with is if 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 Lou Reed is New York and so and so is with the Beatles or Liverpool or whatever, he is Boston. Everything. Yes. Is yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's he would be a great film actually. I'm amazed. No, nobody's made a documentary about the full Jonathan Richmond story, have they? Well, he's been sitting in trees, and there's something about Mary, if you remember rightly. Yes, but when she walked <laughs> back, he is crooning away. Yeah, and he's made some brilliant records over the years. I know, was it Mark? Mark, you introduced me to that brilliant thing. You, I, you're crazy for taking. You're crazy the bus. for taking the bus. Have you ever heard fantastic. that, Dave? Do you know that one, Dave? God, it's a country western brilliant. song. Brilliant. No. It's all just about traveling on the Greyhound bus and all yeah, the lunatics that you meet on the Greyhound so that's bus. That's how he toured. He wouldn't go on the plane because his guitar fan, would get crushed. Fan yeah. Mansions have a song, which is one of their best songs, called Only Losers Take the Bus. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, Dave, it's been a delight talking to you. Um, no, it hasn't because I haven't been able to show show and tell. No, I don't worry. It doesn't matter at all. It was fantastic. Done, it was riveting. You've done pl plenty of telling, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah right. That's where we expect from professional communicators. Very Indeed. nice to talk to you. And, fantastic. Uh, and maybe we'll all be, at some point in the future, in the same country where we can gather around an actual live space and, and exactly. drink, drink a yeah. pint of... Uh, Warm willy ale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Well, and Mark, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And also, David, um, next book is going to be all about, and I'm not talking about the musical, I'm talking about hair. <laughs> I, <laughs> I made the mistake of telling Dave on, the, on this program the weekend. I said that, that my agent's trying to get me to write a book about hair and rock and roll. Really good Dave, idea. Dave's rather taken with this idea. I am too. It's a brilliant <laughs> idea. You should do it. Well, you Usually never not. know. Watch this space. I better go run, run along and get on with it. All right, Very okay. nice to see you, Dave. Yeah, great to see you. Guys. Thank you very okay. much, Dave. Bye. Guys. Pleasure. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.